my pleasure to be here to, to present to you the ultimate proof of creation. And that's not just hype. I believe that there is an ultimate proof for creation, and I'm going to present that to you today. And that alone ought to be worth the price of admission, don't you think? An argument that you can't refute, an argument that uh, for the biblical creation worldview that is irrefutable. And uh, when you present this argument to people, however, I have to warn you about something. Because a lot of people think, well, if it's an ultimate proof, then when I present it, the person ought to convert right there. But the fact is, people don't always, um, people are not always convinced, even by a very good argument. Isn't that right? And uh, people sometimes are convinced by a very bad argument. That's what logical fallacies are. They're bad arguments that people tend to find convincing. So I can't promise you that this argument will necessarily persuade people because there is a difference between proof and persuasion. Just because an argument doesn't persuade doesn't mean it's not a very good argument. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the argument. It means there's something wrong with people. People are not always completely rational. But you see, it's not our job, really, to persuade people. Our job is to give a defense, to make an argument for the Christian worldview. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do today. And I can guarantee you this. There will be no rational comeback from this argument. It is absolutely irrefutable. Now, it's a, kind of a different way of thinking that, than maybe some of you are used to. But the fact that it's irrefutable ought to, ought to prompt you to study this and uh, learn this particular method of defending the faith. I'd like to start with some, um, some evidence that is commonly used to confirm creation. And I think, the, I think this is very good evidence. I'd like to start with information science. Dr. Werner Gitt, one of the world's experts on information science, says there is no law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. So that, that sort of makes sense. You pick up a book, it's got information in it, it's got these encoded symbolic messages in there that convey an expected action and an intended purpose. And uh, that doesn't come about by an explosion in the typewriter, does it? You know, when you read a book, it, it, it didn't come about by a random uh, process. It doesn't generate by itself, information doesn't generate by itself in matter. In fact, Dr. Gitz says, when its progress along the chain of transmission events is traced backwards, every piece of information leads to a mental source, the mind of the sender. So although information can be copied, and it can be copied blindly, a Xerox machine can make copies of information, if you trace it back, it ultimately comes to a mind, the mind of the sender. That sort of makes sense. You read a book, you know it has an, an author. And that's also very interesting because, of course, in DNA we have information. And all that information are the instructions that make you, your physical form, and perhaps even some of your uh, personality traits and so on and so forth. And the reason you're a person and not a cabbage is you have instructions to make a person, and a cabbage has instructions to make a cabbage. And that's a lot of instructions. Of course, some of those are the same anyway, because we have some of the same biochemical pathways. But the fact that we have information in our DNA tells us that DNA could not have come about by a random chance process. That information has been copied many times. You got it from your parents. They got it from their parents all the way back to Adam and Eve. And then it came from a mind, the mind of God. So information science confirms creation. Mutations won't do it. Dr. Lee Spetner, PhD biophysicist, says that all point mutations that have been studied on a molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information, not to increase it. Mutations do not add brand new instructions. He says not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. Now, mutations may increase survival value under certain circumstances. That's fine. But they don't add brand new information to the genome. They don't do that. It would violate the laws of information science. Information science, genetics, they confirm biblical creation. And they're not what we'd expect given the evolutionary worldview. So I think that's a great confirmation of, of creation. We could talk about the biblical time scale and the fact that we find C14 in diamonds. And uh, Dr. Snelling talked about that the other night. I think that's a really powerful confirmation of a young earth because C14 does not last even one million years. If the entire Earth were C14, in one million years it would be gone. It would have decayed into nitrogen. I didn't even believe that calculation until I did it myself. It's true. It, 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 C14 just doesn't last that long. And so the fact that we find it in diamonds that are supposed to be billions of years old tells us those diamonds are not billions of years old. They're thousands of years old. In fact, it limits the age at a few, a few thousand years. And that, of course, the 58,000 there is an upper limit. It could be much younger than that. So carbon, it, or C14 in diamonds, and pretty much everything we find in the earth, anything that has carbon in it, has C14 in it, it appears. And that certainly confirms recent creation and a global flood uh, in, in the geologically recent past, not millions of years ago. We could move out into space, talk about comets, the fact that comets are made up of ice and dirt, and they orbit the sun. And every time they orbit, they lose a little bit of material. As the sun blasts away that icy material, it's what forms a comet's tail. 
Of course, we looked at some of those uh, yesterday, those of you that attended my astronomy talk. So comets just don't last that long. They run out of material in about 100,000 years. And I've seen comets be destroyed in one pass as they go behind the sun. I used to have access to the SOHO spacecraft, and it would watch for comets, and among other things. And sometimes they would be destroyed in one pass. They do not last that long. And so if the solar system really were 4.5 billion years old, why do we still have comets? Now, I think these are amazing lines of evidence, don't you? I mean, they're pretty powerful confirmations of biblical creation. But they really don't constitute an ultimate proof. I mean, it may seem like I refuted the evolutionary worldview that I've absolutely demonstrated creation, but I haven't. And the reason is, for every one of these lines of evidence that I've presented to you, an evolutionist can always come up with what we might call a rescuing device. He can come up with a conjecture designed to protect his worldview from what appears to be contrary evidence. So in the case of comets, for example, my secular astronomy friends, they know that, uh, they know that comets don't last that long. But they say, well, but the we know the solar system is billions of years old, so there must be some source of new comets, which they call an Oort cloud after its inventor, Jan Oort. And so the idea is there's this vast sphere of potential comets way beyond the planets, beyond where we can detect it. And every now and then, one of these is thrown into the inner solar system and becomes a brand new comet. So as the old ones are depleted, new ones replace them. That's kind of convenient. So you see the solar system can be billions of years old after all. Now, if I were to ask a secular astronomer, do you have any observational evidence of an Oort cloud? If he's honest, he'll say, well, no, but you can't prove it's not there, right? And that's true. I can't prove that there's not an Oort cloud. It's very hard to disprove something that can't be detected in any way. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that's true. And, and therefore, there could be an Oort cloud. And therefore, comets don't prove that the solar system's thousands of years old. They confirm it, but they don't prove it. And if you think about it, an evolutionist can always invoke a rescuing device because there are always unknowns. We don't know everything. And there are always unknowns in science, and therefore the evolutionists can always invoke a rescuing device. And by the way, so can you. I might ask you a question that you don't immediately know the answer to. You'll come up with a rescuing device. You're not ready to just give up your worldview on the basis of one uns little unsolved mystery there. And so uh, well, I can't really blame my evolutionary colleagues for inventing the rescuing devices. I'm not blaming the secular astronomer necessarily for thinking there's an Oort cloud. That is consistent with his observation that there are comets and his worldview, his belief that the solar system is billions of years old. So he's thinking in a way that is consistent with his worldview. On the other hand, I don't necessarily believe in an Oort cloud. I don't have any reason to. I look at comets and I say, yeah, that's what I'd expect. Because I start with a different worldview, a different way of thinking about things. If you think about it, Creationists and evolutionists really all have the same facts, don't we? I mean, I have access to the same DNA patterns. I have access to the same fossils, the same stars and galaxies as my evolutionary colleagues. We have the same facts, the same physical evidence, as it were. We have the same science. I use physics and chemistry and astronomy. My secular colleagues use physics, chemistry, and astronomy. We have the same science. Why then do we draw such different conclusions about the past? And the answer is we have a different starting point, a different worldview a different way of thinking about things, which you can liken unto mental glasses. Those of you that wear glasses, you know that if you have those off, the world looks fuzzy. You put those glasses on, the world snaps into focus, and you see things as they are. And I like to think of the Bible like corrective lenses. You think, you think about things from the perspective of biblical history, you see the world as it is. I like to think of evolution like uh, red glasses. You put on red glasses, the world looks red. Not that the world is red, but that's what you see, because you see it's biased because of your... Uh, your, the glasses you're wearing. Now, I realize, of course, evolutionists will say, oh, no, we're the ones wearing the corrective lenses. You're the ones wearing the red glasses. And we're going to have to argue for that. My point here is simply that we all wear mental glasses. We all have a worldview. We all come to the evidence with, uh, with certain preconceptions, with certain beliefs about how that evidence should be interpreted. Now, some people might say, oh, no, not me. I don't have a worldview. I, come to the I believe we ought to come to the evidence neutrally and objectively. Well, guess what? That is a belief about how to interpret evidence. See, the philosophy that we should come to evidence without a philosophy is itself a philosophy. <laughs> it's just a very bad one because it's self-refuting. Your worldview is all of your most basic beliefs about reality, which we call presuppositions. Presuppositions, your most basic beliefs about the universe, about how we know what we know, and so on and so forth. They are the rules of interpretation that we assume at the outset before any investigation of evidence. Before you do an experiment, a scientific experiment or otherwise, before you do anything, you already have certain beliefs about how the universe works. 
you already have certain presuppositions. For example, the belief that your senses are basically reliable. You take that for granted, that what you see and taste and touch and smell and so on really corresponds to the actual universe. You couldn't do an experiment on a rock if you didn't already believe that. You'd look at the rock and you'd say, well, just because I see it doesn't mean it's necessarily there. So there's no point in doing an experiment on it. You presuppose that your senses are basically reliable. That your memory is reliable is a presupposition. You believe that what you remember actually happened, right, for the most part. Now, if I asked you, how do you know that your memory is reliable? You say, oh, well, Dr. Lyle, that's easy. I took a test two weeks ago. I did very well on it. It was a memory test. Excuse me, how do you know you took a test two weeks ago? <laughs> See, just because you remember it doesn't mean it happened unless you already presuppose that your memory is reliable. Or lo laws of logic are presuppositions. The fact that uh, the law of non-contradiction, you can't have A and not A at the same time in the same relationship. That is a presupposition. You couldn't begin to reason about things unless you already took it for granted that there are laws of logic. That's a presupposition. Now here's the key. Creationists and evolutionists have different sets of presuppositions, different worldviews, different rules for interpreting the evidence. And that's very important to understand because the battle really isn't about evidence. It's about how evidence ought to be interpreted. And we have different standards by which we interpret the evidence. Now, for the creationist, the Bible is the ultimate standard by which evidence should be interpreted. I'm not saying that all creationists do have the Bible as their ultimate standard. I'm saying they should. The Bible should be our ultimate standard in reasoning. Now, I have secondary standards as well. I do believe that my senses are basically reliable. But that's not my ultimate standard because I know my senses can be fooled. You take a beam of wood, for example, and put it in water at an angle, and it looks like the wood bends when it goes under the water because of the way the light refracts. Now, you don't believe your eyes in those circumstances, do you? You don't believe the wood actually bends just because you see it, because you have a greater standard that solid things stay, so stay solid, even under water, in, under most circumstances. You have greater standards than that. And ultimately, it will come back to an ultimate standard, which I argue ought to be the Bible. The Bible should be our ultimate standard. What about the evolutionist? What is his or her ultimate standard? Well, it actually depends on which evolutionist you ask, because there's not one single evolutionary worldview, but, but commonly naturalism is the ultimate standard for the evolutionist. The, the natu naturalism is the belief that nature is all that there is. There's nothing beyond the natural world. If it cannot be explained by physical processes, it doesn't exist. And then there is also empiricism. That's another ultimate standard that might be used by, by many evolutionists. And sometimes they believe in a combination of these two. But one of them is obviously more ultimate than the other. Empiricism is the belief that all truth claims are answered by observation. If you want to know something, you go out and look. Go out and do an experiment. That's how you answer all truth claims. Of course, I believe many truth claims are answered that way, but not all of them. Let's talk about evidential arguments. And by that, I mean an argument that, that, leaves, that, that attempts to leave worldviews out of the discussion and simply talk on the basis of individual evidences. Uh, evidence by itself, however, will not resolve a worldview conflict. Why is that? Because your worldview tells you what to make of the evidence. You see, that's, 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 why, that, uh, that's why evidence by itself is not going to resolve anything. It's not decisive. It's not that people don't have enough evidence for creation. The Bible tells us everyone has enough evidence for the Creator God in Romans 1. Everybody knows that. The problem is they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And, and God tells us there's no excuse for that. So it's not that people don't have enough evidence. Their, their presuppositions tell them what to make of that evidence. And I want to give you a silly example just to drill this home. There was a man who was convinced that he himself was dead. He thinks he's dead. And he's very upset about this. He doesn't like being dead. Who would? And his doctor is trying to convince him, look, fellow, you're, you're perfectly healthy. I mean, you know, you, you're not dead. You're, you're walking and talking. And the guy thinks about it and he says, yeah, but, you know, people can have muscle spasms even after clinical death. That could explain my ability to walk and talk. And the doctor says, but look, I have medical charts showing you're perfectly healthy. And the guy says, yeah, but, you know, who knows if, that's, who knows if you're interpreting that properly? And uh, in any case, uh, maybe that's not even my chart. Maybe the name got swapped. And the doctor says, okay, I, I'm going to prove to you that you are not dead. Do dead men bleed? The guy thinks about it for a second. Well, the circulatory system would be stopped. No, dead men don't bleed. And, and the doctor very quickly takes a little pin, pricks the guy in the hand. Sure enough, blood comes to the surface. The doctor says, see, you're bleeding. To which the man responds, well, how about that? I guess dead men do bleed. <laughs> Silly example, but it, it illustrates the point. Did, did the doctor have evidence for his position? Absolutely. The guy could walk and talk. He had medical charts. The guy could bleed. Did the man find those evidences convincing? No. Because he had a worldview. He had a presupposition that he himself was dead. And that presupposition told him how to interpret each one of those evidences. He was always able to come up with a rescuing device. And a clever person always will come up with a rescuing device. 
That's why you can't just throw evidence at people and expect them to change their worldview. There's no, there's no obligation for them to do so. They're just going to interpret that evidence accordingly. That's why you can't just, people don't just need more reasons to believe. That's not a logical or biblical approach to apologetics. They need to have their worldview challenged. That's what we want to do. Now, you may have very good evidence for creation. You might say, see how this is evidence that the Bible is true? And maybe it's very good evidence that confirms creation. I'm to think fossils are very good evidence that confirm the worldwide flood. Don't get me wrong. But that's because I'm looking at it properly through biblical glasses. My secular colleague is going to look at that same evidence through secular glasses. And what's he going to say? He's going to say, that's not how I see it. That's not how I see it. He's going to come up with a rescuing device to account for that evidence according to his worldview. And to add insult to injury, he's going to say, actually, you're the one coming up with the rescuing devices. My explanation is the right one. And so, and so we think, oh, well, maybe that's not a good evidence. Let's try something else then. What about canyon formation? See, canyons can form quickly. And he says, well, maybe that one did, but how do you know that the Grand Canyon formed quickly? You don't know that. Oh, but, but well, we need another evidence then. Look how rock layers can be deposited quickly. So, well, Mount St. Helens proved that. And he said, well, maybe those ones can form quickly, but how do you know that all of them have formed that way? Maybe some of them are slowly over billions of years. Oh, but, but you see, animals, they, they reproduce according to their kinds. That's what we'd expect. He says, well, maybe they do today, but given enough time, one kind can change to another. Oh, but, but DNA, you know, DNA has information in it. It never comes about by chance. He says, well, maybe there's some unknown mechanism that produces it. Give us time. We'll find it. Oh, but, you know, there's comets out there. They don't last billions of years. Oh, but there's an Oort cloud, he says. Now, it's not wrong to show people that, that there's evidence that is consistent with God's word and confirms that. In fact, I think there's value in that. But evidence by itself is never decisive because you always require a worldview to tell you what to make of that evidence. Therefore, a philosophically astute person will not be persuaded by mere evidence. And that's probably worth getting in your notes. A philosophically astute person will not be persuaded by mere evidence. Why? Because if he's clever, if he's philosophically astute, if he's sticking to his worldview, he's going to come up with a rescuing device for every evidence that you present. You see, and so he's not going to be persuaded one way or the other. Evidence by itself is not decisive because a person's presuppositions tell him what to make of the evidence. And why is it we have a difficult time with this? Well, I think part of it is we tend to spend a lot of time with people that have the same worldview that we do. And therefore, they are inclined to interpret the evidence the same way. And so we can change their mind on something by presenting new evidence. If you and I had a disagreement about whether or not there are crackers in the pantry, we can settle that disagreement by going over to the pantry, opening it up, and see if there are crackers there. And we should be brought to the same position based on this evidence because we have the same worldview. We already agree on the rules of interpretation. And so, yeah, you see, see the crackers? There, there they are. I was right. And so you're, we're, our beliefs are brought into alignment. But if I'm having that same discussion with a Hindu who believes that this universe is illusion because Hindus have a monistic worldview. They think this, this world is all illusion. And I show him the crackers, he's going to be convinced? No, he's going to say that's an illusion too because he's got a different worldview. You see, evidence is not decisive when it's a worldview discussion. And origins, guess what, is a worldview discussion. And so we need to keep that in mind. And the problem with many creationists today and virtually all evolutionists is that they argue as if their opponent had the same worldview they do. And they get very frustrated because they, don't, they say, why don't you understand that this evidence proves my point? Well, we need to think in terms of worldviews. We cannot argue that our worldview is right because of the evidence, because our worldview tells us how to interpret that evidence. And I hope that that is clear. Somehow we need to show that our standard is the correct standard. How are we going to get anywhere then? I'm over here standing over on my uh, biblical presuppositions. My secular friend is standing on his secular presuppositions. How are we going to get, get anywhere in this debate? Let me give you the wrong answer before I give you the right answer. Because good teachers always do that, right? They give you the wrong answer first. Well, the wrong answer is this. And a lot of times evolutionists will say, well, let's meet here on neutral ground. He says, he says maybe there are some presuppositions we can agree upon, and maybe those, you know, we can, we can abandon the other ones. And one of the ones you have to abandon is that the Bible's the Word of God, he says, because I certainly don't believe that. So leave the Bible out of the discussion. We both agree science is useful, so let's just talk in terms of science on neutral ground. Now, what's the problem with neutral ground? There is no neutral ground, right? Jesus says, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Romans 8, 7, the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. Does that sound neutral to you? Hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. There's no neutral. You're either God's friend or his enemy. You're for him, you're against him. You're gathering, you're scattering. There's no neutral ground when it comes to a worldview. We all have a positive worldview. And so we're going to call the attempt 
to be neutral, the pretended neutrality fallacy. And that's what it is. It's a fallacy. Since the Bible indicates that there is no neutral, the claim of neutrality is itself unbiblical. Does that make sense? If you, see, the Bible says there's no neutral. So if you say, oh, yes, there is neutral, and I'm neutral, you've just said the Bible's wrong, in which case you're not being neutral. You're taking a position that the Bible's wrong. So neutrality is a non-neutral position, and so is immediately self-refuting. And so if, if this person says, well, yeah, let's meet here on neutral ground. Leave the Bible out of the discussion because we don't agree on that. We'll just, we'll just take things that we agree on. And if you say, yeah, okay, we can leave the Bible out of the discussion. No problem. Well, neutral ground is really secular ground because the Bible says there's no such thing. And if you agree to his terms for the debate, really, you've lost. Because isn't the debate about biblical authority? We're trying to show this person the Bible is absolutely right in everything it says. And he says, okay, but let's start the debate by meeting on neutral ground, which the Bible says there isn't. And you say, okay, you've started the debate by assuming that the Bible's wrong. How are you going to get to the position that the Bible's true? Right? You, you can't, you can't uh, defend biblical authority by abandoning biblical authority. That doesn't make sense. You've started the debate by conceding defeat. That is not a good way to start a debate. <laughs> Two things to remember when people ask you to be neutral. Because the secularists, they like to think that they're neutral. And they're going to want you to be neutral too. Two things to remember when people ask you to be neutral. One, they're not. Two, you shouldn't be. No one is neutral when it comes to a worldview issue. And you shouldn't attempt to be neutral when it comes to a worldview issue. You can't be anyway. No one can approach evidence without presuppositions. And if they think they are, that's a presupposition. We're to, we're to stand on the word, hold fast the word, both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. We stand on the word while defending it. Now, some evolutionists, well, and even some creationists, will say, well, you can't do that because that's circular reasoning. You can't stand on the Bible while defending it. But, you know, I don't see any intellectual reason why you can't. In battle, you can stand on a hill while you're defending the hill, right? You, have you ever had something in your eye? You go to a mirror, and you can, you can, you know, look in the mirror like that. You can use your eye to examine your eye and correct your eye. And so it's not, it's not a vicious circle to uh, stand on the Word of God while defending it. And by the way, the evolutionist stands on evolution while he's defending it anyway. So think about that. It's not, it's not fallacious. Now, I will deal, deal with this charge of circular reasoning more, um, more cogently, perhaps, in a later session, but it's not, it's not a vicious circle. Well, how then do we get anywhere? Because I'm standing on my biblical presuppositions. I'm not leaving those. I'm not going to try to meet on neutral ground. There's no such thing. My secular colleague is standing on his presuppositions. How do we get anywhere? How are we going to resolve the debate? Is it possible? Yes, it is. And this is really what the ultimate proof of creation is all about. The biblical presuppositions, it turns out, and only biblical presuppositions, make knowledge possible. They make it possible for us to know things. They make science possible. And the Bible tells us as much. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want to begin to know something, you've got to start with God, biblical presuppositions. And there's a flip side to this, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You reject the biblical God, you reject his presuppositions, you're reduced to absurdity, foolishness, the Bible calls it. Because all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are deposited in Christ. All knowledge is in God. So if you want to know anything, it's got to be through God, through biblical presuppositions. Now, there is an immediate objection to this, because a lot of people will say, well, wait a minute, Dr. Lyle. Non-Christians, they do know some things. They do have knowledge. That's true. But you see, non-Christians do know in their heart of hearts the biblical God. And they do rely upon biblical presuppositions when it suits them. They don't do it consistently, but they do rely on biblical presuppositions. Therefore, they are able to know things. Putting it another way, only the Bible makes knowledge possible. So the fact that un unbelievers do know things, all that does is prove that the Bible is true. All it does is prove that they're wrong. Only the Bible provides what we call the preconditions for the intelligibility of man's experience and reasoning. And that's your technical jargon for the day. Uh, man's experience and reasoning. In order for our reasoning, our, th our thoughts to make sense, in order for our experiences in the universe to be intelligible, to make sense, certain things would have to already be true. And those are what we call those preconditions, the preconditions of intelligibility. And what are some of those things? Well, laws of logic. In order for us to think properly, there would have to already be in existence laws of logic. In order for us to do science, there would already have to be certain things in place. Uh, you already believe that your senses are reliable when you do science. That's a precondition of intelligibility. 
And so my argument for biblical creation, and for that matter, for any, any portion of the Bible, for the Bible as a worldview, is that uh, it must be true, because if it were not true, you couldn't prove that anything is true. Only the Bible provides those preconditions of intelligibility, and I'm going to spell that out in the rest of the presentation here. There are certain things we rely upon in order to know anything. We rely upon laws of logic, for example, to make thinking possible. We rely upon a certain degree of orderliness in nature, which we'll call uniformity, which, by the way, should not be confused with uniformitarianism. We don't believe in uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is the idea that rates and conditions have been constant throughout time, or more or less. And so a uniformitarianist would say there's never been a worldwide flood because there's not today. Now, I believe conditions change. The Bible tells us conditions change. But the way in which God upholds the universe, what we would call the laws of nature, do not arbitrarily change. Gravity will work the same on Friday as it did on Monday. But conditions, are ch conditions change. It might be raining on Friday and sunny on Monday. Conditions change, but the laws of nature do not arbitrarily change. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about uniformity, like the laws of nature. Or absolute morality, by which, we make, which, by which we make ethical judgments and we know what is right and wrong. In order for us to have those things, the Bible would have to be true, because those things are all contingent upon God as revealed in the Scriptures. I mean, let's, let's take them one by one here. What about morality? Why would we have absolute morality in an evolutionary universe? If we're just animals, well, animals do what they want. They're amoral. They don't have a moral code. If we're just animals, why would we have an absolute moral code? It doesn't even make sense. Why ought we behave in a certain way? Why should we behave in a certain way? Those kind of words don't even make sense in an evolutionary universe. On the other hand, they make sense in a biblical creation worldview because God created us. He did that back in Genesis, by the way. So you can see how these things all go back to Genesis, a literal Genesis. <clears throat> and because God made us and made us in his image, we're responsible to God for our actions. Absolute morality makes sense in a biblical worldview. What about laws of logic? Laws of logic are the correct standard of reasoning. Why would there be a standard of reasoning in a chance universe where it's, everybody just has different kinds of thoughts? Who's to say who's is right and who's, is, who's are wrong? Right? That's, that's just, it doesn't make sense. But laws of logic make sense in a Christian worldview because they reflect God's thinking. We have a, correct, we have a standard of, of correct thinking because we have the biblical God. God is our correct standard for everything. Why would there be uniformity in nature? Because God upholds the universe in a consistent, law-like fashion. He does that for our benefit, and he's promised us that there will be a certain degree of uniformity in the future as there has been in the past. Now, my point here is not that evolutionists don't believe in these things, because they do. Evolutionists do believe in laws of logic, uniformity, and morality. But those things do not make sense in an evolutionary universe. So they're relying upon something that, we, on their own worldview, would have no rational foundation. It would have no good reason, no justification on their worldview. And so, because when you, when you present this argument, a lot of times the evolutionists will say, well, wait a minute, I don't even believe the Bible, and I, I can use laws of logic. I say, I know, but the fact is, if your worldview were true, you shouldn't. You shouldn't be able to use laws of logic, because those don't make sense, given your worldview. And so what we're going to do is an internal critique showing that he's relying upon principles that are actually contingent upon the biblical God. His worldview is inconsistent. It blows itself up. And uh, just to illustrate this, on the surface, it may seem like we have two competing worldviews. We've got the biblical worldview and the secular worldview. Take your pick. You like the Bible, you like naturalism, you like blue, you like flame color. But we're going to find when we examine these up close, when we open up the hood, as it were, the biblical worldview makes sense. It's going to go somewhere. It's going to lead to knowledge. The secular worldview, when we examine it, it's not going to rationally work. It's not going to go anywhere. It cannot lead to knowledge. And I want to give you some quick examples of this before we go in a little more depth. Relativism. Want me, to, want me to disprove relativism here? It's not hard. Relativism is the belief that all things are relative. There are no absolutes. And you'll hear people who are relativists say things like, well, that's your truth, but it's not my truth, and so on and so forth, which is really a, just a dumb thing to say, isn't it? Because truth is truth, and it's, it's not uh, subjective. Truth is objective. But the relativist, the relativist will say there are no absolutes and, of course, the question you want to ask is, are you absolutely certain? <laughs> yeah. You see, the statement, there are no absolutes, is an absolute statement. So if it's true, it's false. Therefore, it's false. Easy to refute relativism. What about empiricism? I mentioned to you earlier that many evolutionists are empiricists. They believe that all truth claims are answered by empirical observation, sometimes supplemented with the need for logical consistency. Now, I believe, again, I believe in empirical methods. I believe that some truth claims are answered empirically. I believe in the methods of science, but not all truth claims are answered empirically. You couldn't answer the question of life after death empirically. 
I take that on the authority of Scripture that there's life after death. But the empiricist says, oh, no, if you can't see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, whatever, it's not real. It's not truth. And so you must eventually ask the empiricist, how do you know the statement itself is true? How do you know that all truth claims are proved by empirical observation? Did you prove that by empirical observation? No. You can't observe truth claims, right? That doesn't even make sense. You can't see a truth claim. It's abstract. And so the, the notion that all truth, truth claims are proved by empirical observation cannot be proved by empirical observation, therefore ought to be rejected on its own standard. See, empiricism refutes itself, just like relativism. Secular worldviews blow themselves up. All you have to do is light the match and let it go. It will circle back around and destroy itself. It's always the case. By the way, the biblical worldview is the only worldview that won't do that. The biblical worldview is the only one that when you apply it to itself, it's self-consistent. It doesn't blow itself up. All secular worldviews do. So at first it may seem like we, we're on our own little island over there on biblical presuppositions and my secular friend is on, over on his own little island over there, secular presuppositions. At first it may seem like we have no common ground. There's no neutral ground. We've already established that. But you see, the point is, secular presuppositions are sinking sand. They will not support a cogent worldview. Only the Bible can do that. Only the Bible is the, the rock upon which we all must stand. And so when that sand dissolves away, the unbeliever is left standing on nothing. Well, Dr. Lyle, are you saying that all non-Christian worldviews are irrational? Yes. All non-Christian worldviews are ultimately irrational. Now, they may have pockets of rationality within them. Nobody is... You know, just Well, I mean, there might be some people that are just totally insane, but for the most part, people have degrees of rationality. But ultimately, they can't support their, their own notions, you see. And so what is this unbeliever going to do? He can't stand on his own worldview, so he's going to do this. Unbelievers will stand on Christian presuppositions when it suits them, because they have to. They couldn't get anywhere without these Christian presuppositions, like laws of logic. Unbelievers do accept and use laws of logic, and in doing so, they're standing on Christian ground. And they're, they're able to do this, by the way, because they do know in their heart of hearts the biblical God. God has hardwired into all of us knowledge of his law, his moral law, laws of logic, and so on and so forth. And we're able to do that. We're able to reason because God has planted that within us. But the point is the unbeliever is standing on Christian ground and then denying Christianity. He's in self-denial. And when we point this out to him, we would point out he's in self-denial, his first response will be to de deny that he's in self-denial. He'll say, oh, no, laws of logic are not a Christian presupposition. They are secular or maybe neutral. He says, after all, I, I believe in laws of logic. I don't even believe in the Bible. But of course, that's not a, that's not a good argument. I'm, I'm pointing out that if, you, if the Bible were not true, there'd be no basis for laws of logic. So what we want to do is point out his inconsistency. We want to point out that he is standing on Christian ground. He's standing on God's ground. He either needs to get saved or stop trespassing. And, uh, you know, get, get your own laws of logic. Stop borrowing God's. And we, you know, we pray he'll be saved, but that's between him and God. We're just going to point out the inconsistency. And I want to give you another example to illustrate this. A debate over biblical creation is a lot like a debate on the existence of air. Can you imagine two people arguing whether or not air exists? What would the critic of air say? Can you imagine this person making this eloquent argument that air does not exist, all the while breathing air and expecting that we can hear his arguments as they're transmitted through the air? That would be kind of strange, wouldn't it? You see, the critic of error must use error in order to make a case against error. The fact that he's able to argue at all proves that he is wrong. Likewise, the critic of the Bible must use biblical presuppositions in order to argue against the Bible. The fact that he's able to make an argument at all proves that he's wrong. Because you see, the, the uh, secularist is standing on Christian ground using God's laws of logic to try and argue against the Christian position. Now, that is not going to work, is it? That, that his position is self-refuting. And so to illustrate this, I'd like to zoom in on a few of these preconditions of intelligibility, laws of logic, uniformity of nature, absolute morality. We'll probably have time to do two this morning. Let's, let's start with absolute morality. I think this is the easiest to understand. It's a good one to start with if you're new to this, this way of uh, apologetics. If God created us, he has the right to set the rules. Otherwise, why not make our own rules? Well, that, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? In the Christian worldview, God is good and is the standard of goodness. But uh, if it's just... You know, if we're just rearranged pond scum, why not do what you want? And by the way, it has to be the biblical God because it's the God who created us and who has revealed himself to us in his word. It's got to be the biblical God. It can't be some other. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. If Adam is in your past, if God made you, who owns you? God does. Who has the right to make the rules? 
God does. And so you end up with absolute morality. Absolutes from God. God sets the rules. If ape is in your past, if you're just rearranged pond scum, why not make your own rules, right? You own yourself, and you can determine your own rules. And so we end up with relative morality. Man sets his own rules. Now, some people might say that's right. Morality is relative. You can make up your own rules, and so can I, and, and therefore you can't go around telling other people what not to do. And the moment they say, you can't tell other people what not to do, what are they doing? Telling other people what not to do. Okay. So relative morality is pretty well self-refuting just right there. It's, it doesn't make sense. And nobody really believes in relative morality. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to ask an evolutionist or anyone who's rejected biblical authority, how do you decide right from wrong? Because apart from the biblical God, morality can only be relative, but people cannot live that way. And people know in their heart of hearts that morality is not relative. Now, some people will say, oh, come on, Dr. Lau, everybody knows right from wrong. To which I would respond, yeah, that's because God has revealed himself to human beings. And so in our conscience, we know right from wrong. But my point is, in an evolutionary worldview, why would there be such a thing as right and wrong? And how could you possibly know about it? Say everybody knows is, is not answering the question. Now, I want to give you some possible responses to this. Not that there are any good responses, but that's the point. I want to show you that the best responses to this are not rational. Some people might say, oh, you don't need God to determine right and wrong because morality is what brings the most happiness to the most people. That's a pretty common response from the atheist camp, though it's not universally their response. Now, some, people, some of you might be thinking, well, yeah, that's right. We ought to be concerned about the happiness of others, to which I would say, yes, in the Christian worldview. Right? That's the golden rule. We're to do unto others as we'd have them do unto us. So even here, he's borrowed on the Christian worldview a little bit to support his own. But my point is, in an evolutionary universe, why should I be concerned about the happiness of others? If they're just rearranged pond scum, why should I be concerned about their happiness? Right? Happiness is just a chemical reaction in the brain if you're an evolutionist. So why should I try to achieve that particular chemical reaction and not another? Like, say, pain. Maybe what's good is what brings the most pain to the most people. Right? I mean, it's just, this is totally arbitrary. And totally impractical, too. How could you possibly measure this? I mean, how do, you, how do you know what brings the most happiness to the most people? Do we have little, you know, meters on our arm telling us how happy we are? Can I point my tri tricorder at you and say, oh, you're this, you know, 50 levels of happiness or whatever? That's not going to work. Marquis de Sade enjoyed torturing women. Now, maybe the pleasure he got in torturing women outweighed the pain of the women that he tortured. And so that would be good under this definition. And so you say, well, yeah, that's not going to work. That's not a tenable position. Well, the moral code is simply electrical impulses in the brain. I was debating a, a Ph.D. neurologist, and this was, this was his answer. And I, he was a very smart man. I couldn't believe that he, he gave this ridiculous answer. Because if it's, just, if it's just a section of your brain, if it's just electrical impulses in the brain, why should I follow it? Right? I have other impulses in my brain, too. I don't follow all of my impulses, and that's probably a good thing, right? Because sometimes I'm inclined to do things that maybe are not good. This, this would not be morality if it's just impulses in the brain. It's not, it's not universal laws. And my brain's different than yours anyway. I have different impulses. And so what's good for me would be different than what's good for you. And you can't have objective morality that way. Laws of morality are conventions adopted for the benefit of society. There's something we all agree to them. And, and so, you know, because we need, we need these laws to, to maintain society. Uh, why? That's arbitrary. Well, because it, without that, we'd have disorder. So, it's, it's an evolutionary universe. Well, but Dr. Lyle, we, we need these laws to prevent us from acting, what, like animals? Is that what you want to say? <laughs> ah, but in the evolutionary worldview, that's all we are, right? And uh, by the way, if they're conventional, then different cultures could adopt different laws of morality, right? And so you could have different moral codes in different cultures. Now, there, there have been cultures, in a sense, that have tried this. Hitler thought that it would, be, it would benefit his society to kill Jews, but I don't think that any of us would say that that is really good. You couldn't say that society is evil if this was the definition of morality, because every society would have its different, different moral code. So they're not laws if they're just conventions. And by the way, the word benefit assumes a standard of goodness anyway. Who's to say what's good unless you already have a standard of goodness? So it's a bit circular as well. People can adopt their own moral codes. I had one reporter tell me when he was a secular reporter and he was interviewing me. I said, sure, but if you can, so can I. And you might not like some of the things that I want to do. Maybe I want to shoot you. He got the point. He got the point. He realized that you can't have universal, objective, moral laws if they're just something that people invent. And just to drill this home, consider an evolutionist who is outraged at seeing a violent murder on television. He says, how could that man shoot that little girl? That's terrible. He ought to go to jail. But he's an evolutionist. Why should he be angry? You ever think, I mean, in his worldview, it's just one chemical accident getting rid of another chemical accident. What's the problem? You wouldn't get angry at baking soda for reacting with vinegar. That's just what chemicals do, right? <laughs> and by the way, chemicals don't have a choice. 
So if, this, if, this, if the person that shot the little girl, if he's just a chemical accident, he doesn't have any, you know, just the outworking of chemistry, why would you punish him? You wouldn't punish baking soda for reacting with vinegar. It's just what it does. You wouldn't throw the lion in, in jail for killing the antelope, right? Animals kill animals. What's the big deal? And so the fact that he is angry is a behavioral inconsistency. That's something I'm going to talk about in a later session. It shows that in his heart of hearts, he does know the biblical God. He does know that murder is wrong. Let's move on and talk about laws of logic. These are a reflection of the way God thinks and the way he expects us to think. Now, here's where the critic will say, oh, but Dr. Lau, how do you know how God thinks? And the answer is God has revealed himself. He's revealed some of his thoughts in his word. I don't know all of God's thoughts, but I know some of them because he's revealed them in his word. And that's why it's got to be the biblical God and not some, uh, some God of our own invention. Uh, laws of logic stem from God's nature. And uh, God, we're made in God's image, and so we, we instinctively know these laws of logic. We act on them, like the law of non-contradiction. Now, you all, even if you have never heard of the term before, you immediately know that that's true, that contradictions, two contradictory statements cannot both be true. If I told you my car is in the parking lot and it's not in the parking lot, you wouldn't rush out to say, oh, yeah, I want to see a car that's there and not there. You would immediately assume that, assume that what I told you is false, and you'd be right to do that because that's a law of logic that cannot be violated. But where does that law come from? Why is there a law of non-contradiction? Ever thought about that? Why is it that two contradictory statements cannot both be true? Most people haven't thought about that, but it stems from God's nature. It's because God doesn't deny himself. The Bible tells us, 2 Timothy 2.13, he cannot deny himself. He cannot contradict himself. And all truth is in God. Therefore, truth will not contradict itself, you see. And again, this is why it has to be the biblical God. It can't be the God of the Quran, for example, because Allah does contradict himself. The Quran endorses the gospel of Jesus and then contradicts the gospel of Jesus by saying that Jesus was not crucified and is not the Son of God. So you see, it has to be the biblical God, the God who cannot deny himself according to the scriptures. What are laws of logic anyway? Ever thought about that? A little bit abstract, isn't it? Can you touch a law of logic? Can you accidentally swallow one? No, because they're immaterial. They're not made up of atoms. They don't have a location in space. You can't pull a law of logic out of the refrigerator. They are universal, meaning they apply everywhere. It's not like laws of logic apply in the United States, but not in Europe. There, anything goes. Okay, there you can contradict yourself. No, they're universal. They apply everywhere. They are invariant, meaning they don't change with time. The laws of logic, it's not like they apply on Monday, but not on Fridays. They apply all the time. They're invariant, and they're abstract because they, are, they deal with concepts. So laws of logic are immaterial, universal, and invariant abstract entities which govern all possible conceptual relationships. They describe how concepts relate to each other. And if you think about it, laws of logic are contingent upon the biblical God. The biblical God can account for all of these properties. God's thoughts would necessarily be immaterial. God is an immaterial being. He's spirit. God's thoughts would be universal because God is omnipresent. His thoughts uphold the entire universe, and therefore contradictions can't happen anywhere, for example. Uh, God's thinking would be invariant because God himself does not change with time, and therefore his thoughts do not either. And they would be abstract because all thoughts are abstract. All thoughts are conceptual. So you see, the biblical God can make sense of the fact that we have laws of logic, one correct standard of reasoning that all human beings must adhere to if we're going to be rational, if we're going to, if we're going to come to the truth. But other worldviews cannot account for laws of logic. Take naturalism, for example. And I mentioned earlier, many evolutionists are naturalists. They believe that nature is all that there is. The naturalist attempts to use logic and reason to support his position, but there's a problem. Logic is not part of nature, right? You can't point your telescope somewhere and see a law of logic. They're not natural. And uh, they're in, immaterial. So if everything that exists is part of nature, is material, then you can't have laws of logic. And so the naturalist is trying to use something that cannot exist within his own position to support his own position and to argue against Christianity. The fact that he's able to make an argument at all proves that he's wrong. Now, if he says, well, wait a minute, Dr. Lyle, that can't be because, uh, you know, you don't need to be a, a Christian to use laws of logic. After all, I, I use laws of logic, and I don't even believe the Bible. So you, 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 they can't be dependent upon the biblical God. But that would be no different than the critic of air saying, wait a minute, you don't need air to breathe. I don't even believe in air, and I can breathe just fine. Right? That's not a rational argument, is it? I'm not saying you have to profess a belief in air to breathe, but you do need air to breathe. I'm not saying you have to profess a belief in God to use laws of logic, but you do need the biblical God to have laws of logic. No other worldview can account for that. What are some possible responses to this then? Well, some, some people might say laws of logic are material. They're chemical reactions in the brain. Well, if they're, if they're material, they're not laws. And they wouldn't be universal because they wouldn't extend beyond your skull if they're, just, if they're just in your brain. And we wouldn't have the same laws of logic between any two people because we all have different chemical reactions in our brain. So that one doesn't make sense. 
And some people might say, okay, well, they're not, they're not material, but they're descriptions of material things. They're descriptions of how the brain thinks. But if laws of logic were simply descriptions of how the brain thinks, why would we need laws of logic to correct the way the brain thinks, right? I mean, you don't always think logically, but if laws of logic were just a description of how you think, you could never violate one because you always think the way that you think, yes? Now, we don't always think as God thinks, and that's our problem. That's why we're being irrational. Laws of logic are conventions that we all agree to them, and so they work, like driving on the right side of the road. Oh, but some cultures you drive on the left side of the road. Ah, so if laws of logic were conventional, different cultures could adopt different laws of logic. Welcome to Australia. Here, contradictions are true, right? That's not going to work, is it? Laws of logic are universal, and therefore they can't be conventions. They're a property of the universe, Dr. Lyle. They're just a property of the universe. That's the way the universe is. That's not much of an answer, really. But if they were actually, if they were a property of the universe, well, the universe changes with time. And so we'd expect laws of logic would change. They wouldn't be invariant. And the universe is different in different places. We'd expect different parts of the universe would have different laws of logic. Laws of logic aren't even describing the universe anyway. They're describing concepts, abstract concepts. And so it doesn't make sense for them to be a property of the universe. One person told me this. He says, well, we use them because they work. And I said, I know, but that's not my question. My question is, how can you account for them in an evolutionary worldview? I know they work. They work because they're true, but why are they true? Why are there these universal, invariant, abstract entities that we call laws of logic? I can account for that as a Christian, but my secular colleagues cannot. They're having to use something that does not make sense in their own position to support their own position. Now, how do we take this information and use it practically in, say, a debate with a critic of creation? And I want to show you what I call the don't answer, answer strategy. Now, I've written some articles on this, so maybe you've seen this before. If you haven't, this will revolutionize the way you do apologetics. It's very powerful. It comes right from the Bible. It's a strategy for defending the faith. And by the way, God knows how to defend the faith. So we ought to, uh, we ought to heed what the Bible says about how to defend the faith. It's based on Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Proverbs 26, 4 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. And I have to point out that when the Bible uses the term fool, it's not just engaging in name-calling. It's not just saying, well, you're just a fool, okay? It's using that term to describe someone who is dense, someone who is perhaps very intelligent, but who refuses to use his intellect in the way that God has intended. And so when I use that term, that's what I'm, that's what I'm meaning as well. We shouldn't go around calling people fools, but the Bible says if they, haven't, if they haven't accepted biblical authority, they are. We need to keep that in mind. Now, we're not to answer the fool according to his folly. We're not to embrace his standard, his presuppositions. Otherwise, what? we would be like him. And so if somebody comes to you and they've got s silly presuppositions, which we're going to represent here as such, and it's, for example, this person says, let's leave the Bible out of the discussion. Well, that's a silly presupposition. Why would we leave the Bible, the inerrant word of God, out of any discussion, especially one that deals with origins? That doesn't make sense. Let's leave the Bible out of the discussion. If you say, yeah, okay, we can leave the Bible out of the discussion, well, then you've become like him. You've answered the fool according to his folly. You've embraced his presuppositions, and now you've become foolish too. Now where are you going to go? You've conceded what you're trying to prove. You're not going to go anywhere. So never buy into the presuppositions of the unbeliever. But then the next proverb says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. And that may sound like a contradiction, but it's not because the sense is different. Uh, we are not to answer the fool according to his folly in the sense of embracing his presuppositions, but we are to answer him according to his folly in the sense of showing where his presuppositions would go if hypothetically they were true. We're going to reflect back to him his own philosophy so that he can see how absurd it is and therefore cannot be wise in his own eyes. It's kind of like I'm not going to live in your house. I'm just going to step inside for a few minutes, destroy all the furniture, and then leave. Okay? It's just a temporary uh, refutation of your worldview, an internal critique, which I mentioned earlier. So somebody comes to you and says, there are no absolutes. There are no absolutes. So you can argue with me, but you can't use absolutes because there, no, there are no absolutes. Now, you're not going to embrace that standard, don't answer according to his folly, but you are going to answer him according to his folly by reflecting that philosophy back to him and saying, well, actually, if there were no absolutes, you couldn't say there are no absolutes. You see how silly you're being? Okay? You're reflecting that philosophy back to him so he cannot be wise in his own eyes. He sees the absurdity of his own presuppositions. Very powerful strategy. Let me show you how it works on a silly example, and then some more realistic ones. Suppose somebody says, I don't believe in words. Prove to me creation is true without using words, because I don't believe in words, so you can't use words. And I, I use that because it's a lot like the people who say, oh, you can't use the Bible, because I don't believe in the Bible. And a lot, of, a lot of creationists would say, oh, you don't believe in words, I guess you can't use words then. I guess we'll have to use charades or something to prove that creation is true. No. Don't answer the fool according to his folly. So follow that don't answer, answer strategy. First of all, you're going to use the don't answer part. You're going to say, I don't accept your belief that words don't exist. I don't accept your standard. Now, by the way, 
you don't necessarily have to say that, but, but in some cases maybe you do. Make it clear that you don't accept, you don't embrace his standard. But then do that internal critique, reflect it back to him and say, but for the sake of argument, if words didn't exist, you couldn't argue anyway. The fact that you were able to make your case demonstrates that it is wrong. You just used words to tell me you don't believe in words. Don't you see how absurd that is? Reflecting back his philosophy to him. That's a great argument. What's he going to say now? If he says nothing, your point stands unrefuted. If he says anything, he proves your point. You see? It's a great way of arguing, an irrefutable way of arguing, really. Don't embrace the presuppositions of the unbeliever. Never put on the suit. But do reflect it back to him so that he can see the absurdity of his own position. And let's take that, that uh, strategy now and apply it to the areas of knowledge that we've already talked about, logic and morality and science and so on. Suppose somebody says, I believe in naturalism. They're probably not going to be that, up, that upfront about it. You're going to have to listen and figure out their worldview. But it becomes clear they're a naturalist. And he says, show me logically how the earth could be 6,000 years old. You're, I hope you're mentally zooming in on two words, logic and naturalism. Because we already saw those two things don't go well together, do they? If you're a naturalist, if nature's all that there is, you can't have universal and material and varying entities like laws of logic. And so now what we're going to do is use the don't answer answer strategy to expose the absurdity of this person's worldview. We're going to say, well, first of all, I don't accept your belief in naturalism. So I'm not even going to attempt to prove creation on your standard. But for the sake of argument, if naturalism were true, you couldn't prove anything because you, you can't have laws of logic if you're a naturalist. You see how powerful that strategy is? Because it goes right to the heart of the issue fast. How about this one? He's, he says, uh, you can't take the Bible seriously. It's full of contradictions. Ever heard people say that before? And we're inclined to say, well, show me one and I'll try and explain it to you. And it, 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 might be, it might be fitting to do that once or twice, but eventually you must get to the don't answer, answer strategy and say, well, first of all, I don't accept your claim that the Bible has contradictions. In my worldview, the Bible's the word of God. It can't have contradictions because God doesn't deny himself. But for the sake of argument, and here's a powerful question most Christians don't think to ask. For the sake of argument, why in your worldview would that be wrong? Oh, well, everybody knows contradictions are wrong. Well, I know contradictions are wrong because they're contrary to the nature of God. But my question is, how do you know that contradictions are always wrong? Why would you have a law of non-contradiction? Well, I've never seen a true contradiction. Well, I've never seen a total solar eclipse, but that doesn't mean they're impossible, right? How do you know that contradictions never happen? I know that because God's knowledge is universal, and therefore, the fact that God does not deny himself tells me that there is a universal law of non-contradiction. But how do you know that? And that's a question you won't be able to answer. I guarantee it. Some people say, well, it's wrong to teach creation in schools. You're lying to children. Think of the children. Don't teach creation. But, of course, lying implies a moral standard, doesn't it? And so this person is borrowing on the Christian worldview to argue against it. And we're going to point that out using the don't answer answer strategy. First of all, I don't accept that teaching creation is lying. I don't accept your claim, your standard. I believe creation is true. Evolution is false. We're teaching them the truth in schools. But for the sake of argument, in your worldview, why would it be wrong to lie to children? Oh, well, everybody knows it's wrong to lie. Well, I know it's wrong to lie because it's contrary to God's nature. But how do you know it's wrong to lie? I mean, in an evolutionary universe, if, if children are just chemical accidents, why would it be wrong to lie to them, particularly if it benefits my survival value? That's what I want to know. It doesn't make sense. The Christian God is not good. He slaughters innocent children. Look at the God of the Old Testament going out and wiping out all those, all those uh, society, societies, genocide and so on and so forth. Now, a lot of Christians find that tough to answer. But if you understand the principles that I've uh, covered today, this is easy because this person is assuming a standard of goodness when he says good and innocent, you see. And so he's borrowing on the Christian worldview to argue against it. And so my response would be like this. I would say, first of all, God is good and is the standard of goodness. That's in the Christian worldview. It doesn't even make sense to say that God isn't good. That's like saying Dr. Lyle isn't very Dr. Lyle-ish, right? <laughs> I'm as Dr. Lyle-ish as I can be because I'm fully Dr. Lyle. God is as good as he can be because he's fully God. God defines what good is. But for the sake of argument, apart from God, how can you determine what is good and who are innocent? And that he cannot do. That can't be done apart from the Christian worldview. If you understand this principle, you can take any argument that's waged against Christianity and show that the argument itself would not make sense unless Christianity is true, all the way back to biblical creation. And you'll learn to see these inconsistencies that people come up with. And uh, I, you know, I think of Richard Dawkins, the guy that goes around preaching atheism, right? I mean, here's a man who is convinced that it's his purpose in life to convince people that there's no purpose in life. You see the inconsistency there? It just doesn't make sense. 
Secular worldviews always blow themselves up. And if you can see that, you're going to see how this guy is not going to be successful in destroying the, the Christian position. He's only going to destroy his own. If you understand that, you can agree with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.20. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Indeed, he has. 1 Peter 3.15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's the key. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. And if you, boy, if you understand this, you can give a powerful defense of the Christian worldview, an irrefutable defense of the Christian worldview, because any counterargument would have to use God's laws of logic, the science, which is a, possible because of God, God's upholding power, or some sense of morality. And so any argument against Christianity presupposes Christianity. It really does. And if you understand that, you've got a powerful defense of the faith. You, there will be no rational comeback. Can't guarantee the person will convert. That's not your job. As, a, as my, um, as a, uh, my uh, teacher, really, Dr. Bonson, liked to put it, he said that it's not our job to open people's hearts. That's the Holy Spirit's prerogative. It's our job to close their mouths. That's what we do. <laughs> We're giving a defense of the faith. And if they convert, that's up to God. And uh, as we get better and better at this, and I guarantee you, it does not take long to get good at this. This may sound a little bit abstract or philosophical. It does not take long to learn this, really. It's, it's not difficult. And you will be able to slice and dice your opponent. I guarantee it. But, um, and as you do that, it's all the more important that you remember the last part of this verse with meekness and fear with gentleness and respect. I've been kind of blunt in the answers I've given because they're hypothetical, and I want you to get the point. But you know that you need to temper it with uh, politeness, never at the expense of truth, but you do want to be gracious in the way that you answer because critics are made in the image of God too. And so we need to show them the proper respect. The key to defending the faith is to stand on the authority of the Word of God and point out to the unbeliever that he is also standing on the authority of God. He's relying upon God's principles to argue against God. It's not difficult to get this stuff. I've been able to teach this to teenagers in three days. And they got it because I gave them a test afterwards and they did very well on it. One of them got a perfect score. So this is not, and I'm, I don't give easy tests. So this is, uh, this is not difficult to learn. But I have written a book on this topic, which I'd encourage you to get, The Ultimate Proof of Creation. And it's a very different way of, of thinking about apologetics. I admit that, but I think that's good. I think it's a very powerful way. And I have yet to lose a debate once I, when, when I've used this particular method, when I've stood on the authority of God's word. Yeah, because God knows how to argue. Who can contend with the Almighty, right? If you master this method, you'll not lose an origins debate. If you master the method. Learn to think like Christ, and you will have a very, very effective apologetic.